Good morning. Good to see this number out today. We have guests with us today, and we're especially grateful to see you, and hope you'll stick around after services and let us get to know you better. Appreciate the, the great job that Philip's done in leading us in singing, and appreciate that uh, greatly worded prayer that uh, Jason led us in. Uh, it's been a blessing to be here this morning, hasn't it? And uh, we're grateful that you're here and you're a blessing to us as well. I, I do want to encourage you, by the way, men, if you've not done so already, to sign up for our men's uh, day that's coming up this Saturday. I would also encourage you to bring uh, your sons with you if they're big enough to sit and listen, and, and uh, they'll enjoy it too. Bob Turner is going to be our, our main speaker this Saturday, and Bob is one of my favorite men in all of the world. And and uh, he uh, is one that studies leadership in, in the, the various capacities in which that uh, you can study it from. W when we think about leadership in the church, oftentimes we, we uh, just solely uh, funnel that down into, into talking about the eldership. Maybe sometimes the eldership and the deacons, but leadership is our principles. And these principles that, uh, that Bob and the other speakers are going to talk about certainly will be uh, applicable to those who would serve as shepherds or deacons, but uh, for all of us in our lives as spiritual leaders, as uh, husbands, as people in our, our workplaces, wherever we might be, they're all uh, aspects that will be beneficial to us. So I, I hope you're planning on being here this Saturday. It'll be a great day for sure. If you open up your Bibles to Romans chapter 2, in the book of Romans is where we're really going to to uh, spend our time today, you know, we have been uh, for a couple of weeks now, we've been looking at this idea of uh, one word and back to basics and some of those kinds of things that, that uh, we have uh, uh, set out this year to try to, to really focus our attention on and looking at one word that would help us um, get back to the basics, help us to, to get a a good foundation of the things that God would have us to know and looking at, at really one concept at a time and one word at a time. And so last week we began that idea by looking at a, a mini-series of lessons where uh, we've been talking about the, the roots of our redemption. Last week, of course, we talked about, about sin and, and how that is a fundamental uh, idea that we have to, to really get as we seek to be who God would have us to be, as we look into his word and try to be the people he would have us to be, we've got to understand what sin is and what sin does. And, and from the very beginning, in the Garden of Eden, it's that sin that separates us from God. And it's that sin that ruins our relationship, and even our lives, but ruins our relationship with him. And because of that sin, we talked about last week, that there were certain punishments that God put into place for mankind and of course that's because that sin being a just God he requires there being a penalty for it and we understand that in, in life don't we you know if if you're a school teacher and you tell your class I want you to to write a, a research paper on the Emancipation Proclamation it has to be 10 pages long and if you do not write this paper you're gonna fail uh, American history and if you do this paper and do it well, then, then we're going to have an ice cream party for everybody that does their, their assignment. And at the end of the assigned time, 24 of your 25 students come in and, and they've done the paper. And then little Johnny comes in and, and he said, I just didn't do it. Why not? Well, I just didn't want to do it. Well, that's all right. You're still going to make a B and you get to come to the ice cream party. Everyone in your class, except for Johnny, he would think you were the best teacher ever, of course, right? But everyone else would say that's not fair, right? Because we understand that when, we, that when there's wrongdoing, there has to be punishment. And that's what we see when it comes to the wrath of God. You know, there's a, a little place out in Maryland uh, called Flamingo Flats. It's a spicy sauce company. And their motto is life is too short to eat dull food. And so they have this wide array of all these different kinds of, of uh, spicy hot sauces that you can buy, and they've got all of these uh, very curious names uh, involved with them, like Sting and Linger or Dave's Insanity Sauce. I'd hate to know how hot that one was, right? According to Chili Pepper Magazine, 
Yes, there really is a magazine called Chili Pepper Magazine. It's the trade uh, magazine for people that make spicy sauces. And according to Chili Pepper Magazine, for a while, Flamingo Flats' number one selling product was their flavor that was in, uh, called Religious Experience. Now, can you imagine how hot that sauce was? In fact, it came in three different varieties. You could either get original, you could get spicy, or you could get the wrath of God. And if you think about it, in our relationship with God in one of those three states, we're either lukewarm, our relationship with God is spicy, or it's wrath. That's the three. And as we look into God's word, as we, we think about this idea of wrath and what it really means for us, there's several words in the Old and New Testament. There's about three in the Old Testament that, that we could look at. And as we look at what those words mean, we kind of get a better idea of what we're talking about when we talk about wrath. One of those words means anger. One of those words means to be furious. One of the words means rage. And, and actually the word... Uh, the, the, the root word actually means nostril. The, the Jewish people are very, uh, very concrete. And so the word for rage is the same word for nostril. Because you think about it, if somebody's really mad, what do you, where do you see it at? When their nostrils flare, you know? That's the, the imagery of God that's being painted for us. In the New Testament, there's a couple of different words. One of those words means a strong... Uh, indignation or retribution for wrongdoing. One of the words means an intense displeasure or anger. And as we think about the word wrath, if you look into the Old Testament, Ezekiel is a great place to, uh, to look at God's picture of wrath towards his people because in the book of Ezekiel, 35 times the word uh, for wrath is used in that particular book. And many times in that book, God will talk about how that he will spend his wrath. He'll talk about how that he will pour out his wrath. And those are very powerful images to our mind, aren't they? Uh, this idea that, that God is a God of mercy and God is a God of patience, but, but there comes a time as we continue to, to sin, we continue to do the things that we want to do rather than what God wants us to do, that, that there's going to come a time where that cup is going to be completely full and he's going to, pour it out on us. We sing the song that uh, has that same kind of imagery that we see throughout the Old Testament where it talks about he's trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. Remember singing that? That, that idea that, that every nation, every people has this, this big wine vat and, and our sins are the grapes that he's throwing in there. And there comes a point where that wine vat gets full and when it's full, God gets out in there and, and he tramples down the grapes of wrath. He's a God that's merciful and a God that's patient and a God that's loving and kind. But there comes a point that he pours out his wrath. And the book of Romans is a place in the New Testament that we can look and see about the wrath of God because it's a word that's repeated many times there as well with the, the text that Gordon read for us a few moments ago in Romans chapter 1, verses 18 and 19, he talks about that wrath that's being stored up against certain individuals, certain people, because of the things that they are doing. And as we get into Romans chapter 2, where's where we're going to spend our time today, in Romans chapter 2, he, we see this idea of, of how that uh, he's shifted his, fo his uh, focus from the, the, the Gentiles that he was talking about in, in chapter 1, over to the Jews, which is his primary focus in chapter uh, 2. And so as you begin to look at, at the passage here in Romans chapter 2, we're going to look at today really four aspects about the wrath of God, four aspects that we've got to get if we're going to understand uh, the wrath of God and really appreciate exactly what it is that we're talking about when we, when we talk about the wrath of God. First of all, we notice that, that the road from wrath that God has given us in the first four verses here. In Romans chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, he begins talking to the Jews and tells them in verse 1, 
how that they were inexcusable. See, as, as this Roman letter is being read, and, and he's detailing in chapter 1 all the sins of the Gentiles, you can imagine the Jews sitting over there, and they're really amening this sermon, aren't they? That's right, boy, Paul. You tell those Gentiles about all the things they've done to incur God's wrath upon them. And then in chapter 2, he says, you know, you're, you're guilty of passing judgment, but you've been doing the same exact things. You've been doing the, the same wrong things. Imagine the unbelievable arrogance of the Jews in that they're doing the very same things as the Gentiles, yet they thought they could get away with it just because we're God's people, just because I've been circumcised after all, see? We're chosen of Abraham. We're God's people. And when we're honest, we know that God really does punish wrongdoing, doesn't he? He really does punish us when we do wrong. And that's, they knew that as well. They had seen that and experienced that in, in their lives. They knew what God had done, but it's so easy for us to not think about it in that kind of, of way. So you look here in verse, verse 4 especially, he says, Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance. You see, the idea that he's, he's wanting us to see here is that, that God has given us a road away from wrath. <coughs> Excuse me. God doesn't want us to have to, to experience his wrath. God doesn't want to have to get to the point that that cup gets so full, that that wine vat gets so full that he has to trample out the grapes of wrath, that he has to pour out his wrath and indignation. In fact, the only way we can have wrath is if we choose God's wrath, isn't it? All the things, he says, imagine all the things that I've done for you in order to keep you from having to go through my wrath. Now, whoever's in the back, if you'll turn to the next slide there, he details that, that particular segment he details there in verse 4 those three things that he's, he's given us, that, that pathway away from his wrath. He talks about how, first of all, that he's given us his goodness or his kindness, uh, his, his mercy, his, his lovingness, his kindness and goodness has been shown to us in so many ways. God could have reacted to our sins in anger. What we deserved is death. What he should have done was was strike us down immediately, but he didn't do that. Instead, he showed us goodness and kindness. It's the same word that we find over in Romans chapter 11 and verse 22 where he says, Therefore, consider the goodness and severity of God. For those who fail severity, but towards you goodness, if you continue in his godliness. God should have immediately struck us down, but he didn't. He was good to us showed us instead his kindness. And then he talks about his forbearance or his tolerance, that he's, he, uh, this amount of time that he has given us, his restraint or his lenience towards us. If you look back into Romans chapter 3 and verse 25, uh, talking about Christ, he said Christ was one that he sent to be a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness through his forbearance. Not that he puts up with sin, but that he puts up with us while we are in sin. He, he doesn't just strike us down because of his goodness. He, he bears with us. He gives us time in order to repent and turn from those things. And, and it's a very similar idea that he mentions this third concept, of long-suffering or patience, endurance, being slow to act. He gave them time. He allowed their wickedness to continue over time, not because he enjoyed sin, he, he despised it, he hated it. It hurt him to see his people choose sin over him. The only reason that he, for, that he forbore it, that he was long-suffering, was to give them time to repent. It's the same word that we see over in Romans chapter 9 and verse 22, when he says, what if God, wanting to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering, the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction. 
You know, in 2 Peter chapter 3, Peter says there's going to be all these people come around. They're going to say, what's happened to Jesus? We, we've been here all this time. Some have fallen asleep. They've died, and they still had not seen him return. And in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9, he reminds them that the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but he is long-suffering towards us. Why? Why does he show his goodness? Why does he show his kindness? Why does he show his forbearance and his, his long-suffering? Because he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's what God wants. So the only way that we can have his wrath, God's wrath, is if we choose God's wrath. Go to the next slide, and you'll see number two on your, your outline there uh, is the idea that, that not only is there the the road away from wrath, but God, we see in Romans chapter 2, uh, tells us about their response to his wrath. After all God has done for them, what's their response to him laying out this road away from his wrath? Well, in verse 5, he says, But in accordance with your hardness and your impenitent heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath. In the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. How do they respond to these things? They were hard-headed. They were hard-hearted. They had an unrepentant heart because they said, I don't care what God has done. I don't care about the wrath that's coming. I'm going to live the way I want to live. I'm going to do whatever I want to do. So what does that lead? When God says, here's the alternative. You can, you can have wrath or you can have reward. You can serve me or you can serve sin. If you serve sin, you get punishment. If you serve me, you get eternal life. And, pe and we say to him, well, I'm going to do what I want to do. What's left for him to do? But wrath. And that's all we have. This storing up of wrath. It again goes all the way back to that Old Testament imagery. That cup is being filled up, isn't it? Filled up with the wrath of God. The more we sin without penalty, the more that cup fills up, and when it's full, there is no more kindness. So when will that day of wrath come? Well, he tells us in the day of revelation, the day that, that his judgment, that his wrath will be revealed. And that's a day that we don't know when it is. But verse 2, he talks about the judgment of God that's coming. But Jesus talked about over and over how that there was going to be a great day that's coming. All the prophets have been all talking about this great day of the Lord, and sometimes that was the day when Jesus would come, and sometimes that was the day when the gospel would come, when the church would be established, and sometimes it's talking about that final day. And we're all going to stand before him and give an account. And because God has given us this fair warning, he's told us it's, it's one of two ways. And because God has said repeatedly what his wrath is and how terrible a thing it would be, and because he has been so good and kind to us, because he's been so long-suffering and patient with us, when we get to that point, who can say that's not fair? When Johnny had the two weeks to write the paper and he knew all along what was going to happen if he didn't, and he walks in and he doesn't pass American history, and he doesn't get to go to the ice cream party, can Johnny say, well, teacher, you're not fair? Can he say that? He can't, can he? And we understand that with our relationships with each other. We need to understand that with God. He says that, that it'll be a righteous judgment of God because he's warned us of his wrath. And he's shown us that the only way we can have God's wrath is if we choose God's wrath. If you go to the next slide there, whoever's in the back, and you see that, that third aspect of God's wrath that we see in your outline there is the righteousness of God. The righteousness of God. Notice in verse 6, he says that he will render, talking about God, he will render to each one according to his deeds. And what he does here in verses 6 through 10, it's a study on life choices. We've got a choice to make. In fact, th the grand choice that we make is made up of a bunch of little choices that we make throughout our lives. And ultimately, he's going to say in Romans chapter 6 and verse 16, that we are slaves to whom we submit ourselves to. If we choose to submit ourselves to sin, we're a slave to sin. If we choose to submit ourselves to God, then we are a slave of righteousness. We're going to be a slave to what we obey. 
It's a choice that we make. And the only way we'll have God's wrath is if we choose God's wrath. There's a man by the name of Rob Bell who's made himself famous and rich with his book that's entitled Love Wins. And the concept of this book is that, that God loves everybody, and because God loves everybody, that means God's not going to punish anybody. That we're all going to be fine, that God's not going to be uh, pour out His wrath to any one of us, that there's going to be, be a, a time where we, we, God's going to reward some more than others, but, but God loves us all, so there's going to be... That's a great concept, isn't it? Wouldn't that be wonderful if that was true? But it's not. Jesus said in John chapter 5, verses 28 and 29, that there's going to be a, a great day of separation between those who are righteous and those who are unrighteous. We sing sometimes, Jesus is coming soon, morning or night or noon. Many will meet their doom. Trumpets will sound. All of the dead will rise. Righteous meet in the skies, going where no one dies. Heavenward bound. There's going to be a separation. When Jesus comes again, whenever that is, it's going to be too quick for some people, isn't it? If we've suppressed the truth and not realized what that means. So if you go to the next slide, you notice what he talks about with this righteousness of God. He tells us basically that, that there's one of two ways we can go. You can, first of all, obey truth. And he talks about, we get that, that terminology from verse 8. But in verse 7 is where he's talking about what obeying truth means. If we obey truth, he says, eternal life to those who by patient continuance and doing good seek for glory, honor, and immorality. Obeying truth means doing what's right. It means doing what is good in the sight of God. If we do that, he says, we get some things. God gives us certain things, those who obey truth, who are doing what is right. First of all, he says they have eternal life. That's that right relationship with God and with Jesus that begins here in our obedience to him and goes throughout all eternity, John chapter 17 and verse 3. Second of all, he says we receive glory in the same way that Hebrews 2 and verse 7 says that Jesus received glory, that God glorified him to where he is. He says that we'll receive honor. In other words, we'll get that crown of righteousness that Paul talks about in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 7 through 8, that's been laid up not for me only, Paul says, but to all them that love his appearing. When Jesus comes back, the only way we'll love his appearing is if we've obeyed truth. And he says we get immorality, or immortality, not immorality, immortality. We'll get immortality. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 53 through 54, he talks about how that this mortal body is going to put off mortality and put on immortality and live forever. But he starts off all that by saying that it begins with patient continuance. We've got to do it to the end. And, and if we serve God, if we obey truth and we do it to the end, he says this is what we get. If you go to the next slide, you see the other side of the choice. And the other side of the choice is rather than obeying truth, we're going to obey unrighteousness. Obey unrighteousness. Notice what he says in verses 8 and 9. But to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish on every soul of man who does evil of the Jew first and also to the Greek. If we obey unrighteousness, then what we get are these things. If we're doing evil, if we're self-seeking people, as he talks about here, seeking to serve ourselves rather than the Lord, then what we get is anguish, full of distress and turmoil. We get wrath. God is livid that someone would ever treat his word and his son in that way that we have. We get indignation. The word means disgust. God is disgusted with us. You know, he talks about in Revelation uh, chapter 3 to the church at Laodicea that because of their lukewarmness that he would spew them out of his mouth. He's disgusted when we obey in righteousness. And tribulation has to do with the idea of trouble and pain. God is a righteous judge, 
And this is a righteous judgment because he's warned us in advance, this is what happens. And if you look, the, the slide on the board now shows the arrows. These are all antonyms of each other. Just like obeying truth and obeying unrighteousness is the opposite of each other. The effects of those are the exact opposite of each other. See? So God is going to reward us according to what we've chosen. So the only way we can have God's wrath is if we choose God's wrath. If you go to the next slide, you look in Romans chapter 2 and verse 10, you see the fourth aspect of God's wrath, and that's the result that we want from all of that. In verse 10, he says, But glory, honor, and peace to everyone who works what is good, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. He goes back to this idea of glory and honor and peace. But the only way we can have that is if we do what's good, if we obey what's right. And it doesn't matter if you're Jew, it doesn't matter if you're Greek, it doesn't matter if you're red, yellow, black, or white, does it? It doesn't matter if you are rich or poor. It doesn't matter what your physical status is. All God, because he's a righteous judge, a righteous God, all that matters is have you done what he said or have you not? If you do what he says, you get reward. Not that you've earned it or deserved it, but his grace gives it to you. And if we don't do what he says, then we have wrath. You know, we sing sometimes, in Christ alone, my hope is found. Go to that next slide there. In Christ alone, my hope is found. Flip over in your Bibles a couple pages to Romans chapter 5 and verse 9. In Romans chapter 5 and verse 9, Paul connects several significant terms with the concept of God's wrath. He mentions there our being justified and our being saved. We're justified just as if I'd never sinned, so we don't get God's wrath. We're saved from the wrath of God that our sins has earned us. He says that, that all of that is a result of the blood of Christ. See, in Christ alone my hope is found because the blood of Christ is the only thing that can help us to escape. It's the only way by which we can escape. The wrath of God. Think about the significance of the blood of Jesus. You know, we sing, What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. We sing, Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my Sovereign die? Would, would He devote that sacred head for such a one as I? At the cross, at the cross where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I'm happy all the day, because by the blood of Christ, I don't have to choose the wrath of God. The roots of our redemption began in the Garden of Eden, when man first chose sin, and had that separation between God and man. And God, because he's a a holy God said, I can have no part of sin. And because he's a just God, he says, there must be a penalty. There must be a punishment. My wrath is what this would equal. Because he's a loving and merciful and gracious God, he provides us with the only way to escape wrath. The way that he wants us to choose. Because the only way we can have God's wrath is to choose God's wrath. Why would you choose that? If this morning you realize I hadn't been obeying truth, I hadn't been doing the things that I should, I need, I need to come back to the Lord. I need to have that blood of Christ wash away my sins. If we believe that Jesus is God's Son, if we accept Him as Lord of our life, if we confess that He is our Lord before others, then we can be baptized, immersed. Romans chapter 6 tells us that when we are baptized, we're we're, we're baptized into his death where he shed his precious blood. That we're buried with him by baptism. That we're raised to walk in newness of life. It's through baptism that we reach the death of Jesus. That we reach his blood. 1 John chapter 1 tells us that if we walk in the light as he is in the light, that the blood of Christ continues to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Are you in need of the washing power of the blood of Jesus? We can study with you. 
we can help you in any way, if we can pray with you and for you, if you, if you want to put on Christ in baptism, you don't have to choose the wrath of God. No one in this room wants you to choose the wrath of God. The Lord himself is, is begging you, please, don't choose wrath. Choose me. Won't you do that while we stand and while we sing?